Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul at Radio Free Hammer Hall. Today, we are going to take a deep dive into charges and pile-ins. This is going to be a big one, guys, so hold on to your pants. Here we go. So, originally, this was going to be a video about charges. And then I decided somewhere in there that, man, I'm really going to have to make a video about pile-ins as well because it's both of them are such deep topics and then I realized you kind of can't talk about one without the other so I decided to take what maybe could be two separate videos and jam them into one big video on all of the tricks and tactics I could think of around charges and pile-ins movement in general in Age of Sigmar is probably the most important aspect of the game and charges and pile-ins are just other types of movement beyond your normal movement phase movement so really mastering how to do these sorts of things use these tricks exploit these rules as much as you can it's going to greatly improve your gameplay and help to take you to a higher tier of gameplay in general so my general format for this, I'm going to really go to the original rules as written and pick that apart, analyze everything, then talk about some tactics and then do some visual examples. So I'm going to kind of take this slow step by step and break everything down for both charges and pylons. And I wanted to make doubly sure that I had everything correct rules-wise for this. So shout out to some friends that uh, helped out with proofreading. Uh, I sent it over to Tom Lyons from Warhammer Weekly, as well as Josh Keel from Masterpiece Miniatures. Um, both of them are very astute uh, students of the rules. So uh, I really appreciated their assistance, uh, making sure that I got the rules right in this and my analysis was correct. And also just wanted to give a quick shout out to Tom Lyons for his original pile-in video that he made a couple of years ago. Uh, that was definitely an inspiration for some of the tactics that I'm going to talk about in here. Um, and it definitely uh, helped get the wheels turning and give me some ideas on where to go with this. So with that, let's start by looking at charging. So this is the rules as written for charges. And I'm just going to read this out. And, you know, you guys can skip ahead a little bit if you don't want to just, you know, hear me read the rules. But this is just rules as written for charges. Any of your units within 12 inches of the enemy in your charge phase can attempt to make a charge move. Pick an eligible unit and make a charge roll for it by rolling 2d6. Each model in the unit can move a number of inches equal to the charge roll. You cannot make a charge move with a unit that has run or retreated earlier in the turn or with a unit that is within 3 inches of an enemy unit. The first model you move from a unit making a charge move must finish the move within one half inch of an enemy model. You do not have to pick the target for the charge before making the charge roll. If that's impossible or you decide not to make the charge move, the charge fails and no models in that movement or unit can move in this phase. Once all models in one unit have made their charge moves, you can pick another eligible unit to make a charge attempt until all units that you want to make charge attempts have done so. So let's break this apart and look at what these sorts of things are actually telling us. So first of all, your eligible units are any unit within 12 inches of an enemy model. That's pretty simple and straightforward. The thing to bear in mind that that is what is making them eligible for a charge it is not restricting how far something can move in a charge move, and it's not telling you that the end of your charge has to be within 12 inches of 
where you begin. If you have charge bonuses that take you over that 12 inches, you know, you can make a 14, 15, 16 inch charge, whatever. Um, if you happen to like roll really high and have a bunch of bonuses that, um, the 12 inch rule is just about what is eligible to make a charge roll. It's not limiting where your unit can charge. So our next clause here is each model in the mo unit can move a number of inches equal to the charge roll. So that really, I would interpret that as saying it may move up to a number of inches equal to the charge roll. It's basically how we all kind of interpret it. But there's some specific things that are kind of left out by this. It doesn't say where the models have to go, what direction they have to go in, and it doesn't necessarily require that you move all of the models in a unit. And even if you do interpret this as, you know, requiring all of the models in a unit to move, you know, you can move them a millimeter if you choose to do that. You know, it, it, a tiny move is still a move. So the first model that you move from a unit making a charge move must finish the move within one half inch of an enemy model. And you do not pick the target for the charge before making the charge roll. I like that they have included in here that like designer note that you don't have to pick a target. That's something from prior editions of Warhammer that you had to announce your charge targets and a lot of people still sort of think that way in Age of Sigmar, just as like a carryover rule, but it's very specifically here called out that you don't have to announce where a unit is charging, only that it is making a charge attempt. And only one model from the unit is required to end a charge within one half inch of an enemy model. So... That is really the only requirement you have for a charge in terms of the direction and uh, placement of models when you're making a charge. All you have to do is have one model and within one half inch of an enemy unit. Otherwise, all of the models in that unit just get a 2d6 move. And you know, in addition to that, you have to keep unit coherency, but that one half inch of within an enemy model is your only restriction. So I just want to emphasize that very strongly that it's not that you have to maximize everything within a half inch. It's not that you have to get into base contact. It's just that one model from the unit has to end within one half inch of an enemy model. And here is another important clause in this as well. If it's impossible or you decide not to make the charge move, the charge fails. So in every charge phase, you can choose to roll 2d6 for every single one of your units that is within 12 inches of the enemy and decide whether or not you're making that charge move after the dice are rolled. So an important application to this is say the unit that you really want to charge is 10 inches away, but you have another enemy unit that's maybe five inches away. That closer enemy unit is going to be easier to charge, but the real target that you want is 10 inches away. So you attempt that long bomb charge. If you don't get the 10 inch charge that you need, you're not obligated to charge anything that is within range. You can simply choose to not make a charge move even after you make the roll for it. Very important there when you are thinking about uh, how these rules actually start to apply on the table. So I just want to break this down a little bit further and 
emphasize a few things again. Each model may move up to the charge roll. You don't have to move each model. The only requirement is that you get within a half inch of an enemy model. That's all that's required for a charge. All of the rest of the models in a unit can move wherever they want up to that 2d6 inch charge that you rolled. As long as you're keeping unit coherency, those models can go anywhere. You don't need to end in base contact. You don't have to maximize base contact it, or anything else like that. You don't have to make your charge in such a way that uh, is maximizing your pile-in potential. You just have to have one model within one half inch of an enemy model. Also, noting here that you can charge multiple enemy units with one unit of yours. Since you're not picking one enemy unit as a target, you just are declaring a charge, you can end your charge within three inches of multiple enemy units, which can enable some interesting shenanigans, and we will talk about that more later. So pile-ins. This is a very short bit of rules that has a lot of of uh, a lot of detail and finesse to how it actually plays out on the table. So a unit can make a pile-in move if it is within three inches of an enemy unit or has made a charge move in the same turn. If this is the case, you can move each model in the unit up to three inches. Each model must finish its pile and move at least as close to the nearest enemy model as it was at the start of the move. And then there is an FAQ on this. Uh, the question is, when one model piles in, if it is equally close to two different enemy models, do I have to finish the move as close or closer to each of those models for example, if my model is in base contact with two enemy models, does it have to finish a pile and move in base contact with both of those models? And the answer is yes to make uh, to both questions. If it's impossible, the model cannot move. So if you get in a situation where you have multiple enemy models in base contact, with one of your models, then that model effectively cannot pile in because it can't get any closer to those two enemy models. The only caveat that I would put on that is that if the model can fly, it is possible to still make a pile in move if they can jump over onto the opposite side of those enemy models. Uh, because pile-in moves also would include flying, so you could theoretically pile in over a unit with flying. So, important things to note here in these rules. You can make a pile-in move if you're within three inches of an enemy, or you have made a charge move in the same turn. If you have a unit that charges, it is always eligible to make a pile-in move, even if there are no enemy units within three inches of it at the time that it activates to pile in. So, what does that mean in effect? If you have multiple units charging at one unit, or you have um, an effect that does mortal wounds after you finish a charge, you know, things that can potentially get a unit to blow up before you complete a chart or before you activate your unit for combat, you still get that pile in move. And it still just has that requirement of moving 
up to three inches towards the nearest enemy model. So it's possible to have a unit at the start of its activation, because it charged that turn, not being within three inches of an enemy unit, but making a pile-in move, getting to within three inches of another enemy unit, and having then the weapons reach to make attacks against a unit that it was not within three inches of at the beginning of the combat phase. I know that was just an awful lot of complicated stuff, but this is a complicated topic, so keep your thinking haps on. We'll get through this. And just to reiterate here, each model must finish its pile and move at least as close to the nearest enemy model as it was at the start of the move. So, a big thing to note here is that once, essentially once you're in base contact with an enemy model, it really restricts you as far as where that model can go afterward. If you leave yourself room between your models and enemy models, then it gives you the opportunity to continue moving your models around with successive pile-ins uh, if you're going to have multiple turns of combat. If you are in base contact with an enemy model, you can still pile in. You can still make a move up to three inches. You just have to stay in base contact with that same model. In other words, you can sort of slide around the outside of that enemy model. The only thing that is driving your movement in any given pile-in move is what the closest enemy model is to that model at the start of the pile-in move. The closest model to the closest enemy model, I should say, to your model at the beginning of the pile-in move and at the end of the pile-in move could be two different models. This is actually a an important tactical note for when you are planning to or planning for having a combat that lasts more than one turn, you want to have that flexibility to be able to continue to pile your unit in if it's a large unit. So if you keep space between your model and enemy models, it can let you flow around the enemy unit, getting more and more models into attack range with each successive combat. Alternatively, if you're doing this in a defensive mode, because we always have to think about this from the flip side as well, using it defensively, you can use your pile-in positioning to control where your opponent's models can go once it's their turn to activate. So you can block your opponent's models out of piling in through your own pile-in moves by getting things into base contact with multiple of your models to freeze those models in place. Um, just positioning your models in such a way that there's nowhere for the enemy models to go, or if there is somewhere for enemy models to go, it is not going to be easy for them to get more models into combat. The whole idea here with pile-in moves most commonly is going to be moving your models in such a way that you're going to get the most models into combat and possibly most models into combat in future turns, as well as if you're playing more defensively to prevent enemy models from getting into combat just through model positioning. 
So it's very important to simply really understand and internalize the rules so that you can make better plays when you're at the table. These are really fine points that we're looking at here in the wording of these rules. And it you might kind of say it's rules lawyering or it's nitpicking, but if you're going to play this game at a competitive level or even if you just want to improve your game, understanding these rules is going to be key to playing at a higher level than where you currently are. So it's very, very important to understand these things. And even if you're not looking to abuse these rules, it's something that you need to be able to watch out for for what your opponent is going to do. So using them defensively and being aware of what your opponent may be able to do is very important and is going to definitely win you games. So what else do we have here out of pile-ins? I think I've kind of gone through most of this already, what I have on this slide, uh, just from talking through the last slide, but I just want to reiterate things really quick. Uh, your model can be more than three inches away from an enemy model before it makes a pile-in move. In fact, your entire unit can be more than three inches away from enemy models before they make a pile-in move if they made a charge move in that turn. Your pile-ins can draw new enemy units into combat that weren't there at the beginning of the combat phase. That is a very important tactical point that we're going to look at later where we want to look at how we can exploit opportunities to draw units into combat that we want to neutralize as a threat when it turns back over to your opponent's turn. So as we said before, your pylon move has to end close, as close or closer to the enemy model. The path it takes is irrelevant. So as I mentioned before, flying units can go over enemy models and still have it be a legal pylon. A pylon move can result in the nearest enemy model at the end of the move being a different model than it was at the beginning of the move. So in essence, you can slide your model slowly and kind of like slither back around enemy units uh, by simply ending your pile-in move closer to another enemy model than where they were initially, as long as they are still as close or closer to the original model. And as I've noted before, if you're in base contact with two enemy models, it effectively locks a model in place. The only exception to that really being flying units and being in base contact with three enemy models will definitely lock you in place, even if you are a flying model. So let's start looking at some tactics here and what we can do with some creative charge moves and pile-ins. So an important thing that you can do with your charge moves is deny your enemy uh, unit charges and deny enemy movement. So you can do that by snaking out your unit to block lanes of movement after you make a charge move, or you can simply prevent enemy charges and enemy moves by engaging that enemy unit in combat. Unless a unit has rules to the contrary, whenever a unit is 
beginning their uh, movement phase within three inches of an enemy model, they can't make a normal move. They would have to retreat. And un again, unless there are special rules to the contrary, when you make a retreat move, you cannot shoot and you cannot charge with that same unit in that turn. So by making charges, you can prevent your enemy units from charging into the juicy targets that they really want to get into in your lines. One of the other things we can do here is use a charge for bonus movement. This is one that I really like a lot. And this is really emphasizing on that idea that you... Your only real requirement for a charge is that when you're moving that 2d6 inches, all you're required to do is have one of your models from that unit end its move within one half inch of an enemy model. The rest of the models in that unit can go wherever you want them to as long as you're maintaining coherency and you're restricted to that 2d6 inch limit. So this can give you the opportunity to grab objectives, for example, or it can let you uh, snake a unit around to uh, get into uh, bubbles for abilities that would give it buffs. Um, it can let you snake around to block lanes of movement. There's a lot of things that you can do there. And another thing that you can do is generally reduce your enemy combat power. And you do this, there's kind of a couple of different ways that you can do this. One is simply what we would refer to as tagging an enemy unit. And that is really just minimizing your frontage against the enemy unit, where you basically just have that one model within one half inch of the enemy unit and the rest of the unit getting snaked out, you know, maximizing uh, your unit coherency uh, so that when your opponent piles in, they have uh, a minimal number of models that they can actually get into combat. Alternatively, you can do the same concept by charging an enemy unit with two of your units on opposite ends of that unit. And that way, the models in the middle sort of get stuck. And most of the unit gets neutralized and can't make attacks because it can't pile in without breaking coherency. So some other things that we can do with pile-ins. Um, you want to maximize your models in combat by carefully spacing out your models and really being aware of your base sizes and weapon reaches. It's definitely important to note that 25 millimeters is slightly less than one inch. So for occasions when you have a one inch reach weapon, you can get things into base contact and you can have a second rank of models reach over uh, another uh, rank of models with a 25 millimeter base. So you get two ranks of attacks in. Similarly, you can get three ranks of attacks in with uh, a two inch reach weapon, which makes those particular types of units very powerful. If they have two inch reach on a 25 millimeter base, you're getting lots and lots of attacks in. Uh, an important note for maximizing your units in combat is also to not end your charges or any of your pile-in moves in base contact with enemy models. That allows you to continue to have sort of fluid movement in that pile-in phase to keep moving your models around 
and getting as many into combat as you can each round while giving you space to pile in even further in another round of combat. So one of the tricks you can do is what I call an indirect charge. This can happen when you have two enemy units that are close to each other and you're able to get into charge range of one of them, but not the other. But they're close enough to each other that if you charge into the closer unit, you can make a pile-in move into the second unit um, and get all of your attacks in. This uh, can kind of be used in two ways. You can do this to pull a unit into combat to neutralize it. Uh, typically, you're going to get like one model into the three inch range of that other enemy unit after your pile in. And that's going to give them a very minimal ability to pile in and attack you, but it's going to prevent them from uh, shooting and charging in that next turn. Uh, unless they, you know, they would have to have special rules or they would be forced to make a retreat move out of that combat in order to do anything in their next turn. And with that sort of positioning, it's going to be a very unfavorable position for combat. So you're really putting your opponent in a bad place with that kind of positioning. And we'll see that with some examples later on. Also, you can use pylons for some defensive uh positioning you can uh, put a screen or chaff unit out in front of uh, a unit that you're seeking to protect that has better offense but perhaps not as good defense so you position your unit behind your chaff wall but close enough so that when your opponent gets into combat with your chaff unit, they're going to be within three inches of your other unit behind that so that you can pile in and make attacks over your chaff unit or can simply pile straight into your opponent once those chaff models are taken off the table. So... Let's get into some examples. This is what I was just talking about with uh, defensive positioning. So in this example, our enemy is in red, our chaff unit is in blue, and our offensive unit is in purple. So you'd want to position your offensive unit there in purple less than two and a half inches away from the front of the models in the chaff unit. Why do I say two and a half inches? Your opponent has to end their charge within one half inch of your models. So if you are within two and a half inches, even if they get in a position where they just have that one model within one half inch, you are hopefully positioning everything in such a way that that unit is going to be drawn into combat because you are less than two and a half inches away. So your opponent can sit, you know, slightly less than a half inch out from your chaff unit and it's still going to put that enemy unit within three inches of your offensive unit that you're protecting in this particular situation. So the next thing that I would look at here is um, the snake tail tactic. There's a few different things that we can do with this, uh, but the main crux of this is that we are 
making a charge move and fanning out our unit and leaving a trail of models back somewhere else. In this particular example, we're leaving a trail back to a hero that is going to be buffing that unit somehow. Now note, this would only work with an ability that is within, not wholly within. Um, this is not a, a tactic that you would use with wholly within. This is not relevant to that. But there's plenty of within X inches abilities that you can still use this sort of tactic on. Also, you can simply do this to block lanes of movement, preventing pile-ins from other units. You can snake onto objectives doing this as well, or simply hold an objective that you already had. Uh, there's a lot of different applications for this. This is just once again noting that you don't have to necessarily get all of your models into combat, that you have the ability to simply have a 2d6 move with all but one of the models in your charging unit. So this here would be an example of tagging a unit. So we make our charge move with our unit here and we just kiss the last model in that line of enemy models and then string out the rest of our unit. So then what happens here is your enemy can really, in this particular example, when they make a pile-in move, they're really only going to be able to get two models into combat with uh, your unit. And that's really significantly diminishing your enemy unit's offensive capabilities. And, you know, similarly, you're decreasing your own offensive capabilities. But if you're activating this unit after the enemy unit, it still can give you the opportunity to pile in back at full strength, depending on how you position your models and where uh, your opponent's models all end up uh, at the end of their pile-in. So here's what I was talking about with the indirect charge. So in this example, we have two enemy units uh, that we are uh, charging towards with our units. So in the example to the left we complete our charge within one half inch of the closer unit and then pile all of the rest of the unit into the unit that's actually further away once we activate it. We're still uh, maintaining that uh, correct pile in, staying uh, just as close to or closer than we were before with that closest model, um, as well as all of the others. And we are getting all of the models in the unit to swing around and get into combat with that rear enemy unit. Our example on the right, we are doing sort of the opposite. We're getting in here and we're charging our whole unit at that front enemy unit but leaving room off to the side to swing one of our models around in their pile-in move to get within three inches of that enemy unit and draw it into combat with us and that has all sorts of benefits. It's going to be limiting the power and uh, flexibility that your opponent has with that on their next turn. And it's also going to be uh, creating a situation where it has minimal offensive power against you during this particular combat phase. And you also have the added benefit here that even though you are 
positioning your units in such a way that you're drawing the second unit into combat, you are still going to get your full attack power against that primary target in the front that you're looking to go after. All right, so here is an example of uh, using a charge as bonus movement. Uh, this particular example, this is one that I've actually done before. Um, so I, I've just sort of used that specific example. So you have your unit there at the bottom at the beginning of the charge phase. And in this case, we have uh, an enemy monster that we are charging towards. But instead of getting everybody into base contact with the enemy monster, we're getting just that one model within a half inch and then maximizing unit coherency and stretching out towards an objective to seize that objective and um, do that with using our charge move just as bonus movement uh, and being our only real restriction there is being uh, tethered to that enemy unit. So this is where things start to get complicated when we're talking about maximizing our combat moves. What you really don't want to do is that example over on the left where you have neatly ranked models that just charge straight forward and stay in the same formation heading headlong into base contact with enemy models in the charge phase. What we want to do is charge forward and flow our models towards the edges of that combat on either side of it. So that way you can start to move your models around the enemy unit and get more models into combat. And it's very important here to not have your models ever in base contact with the enemy models so you have that extra little bit of flexibility to always be able to slide around and once you kind of get all the way around maximizing your movement around one particular enemy model you can then pile in to be closer to the next model over so on your next activation you then can slide one more model over and I wish I had uh, actually included an example of that, uh, that kind of like sliding technique a little bit more clearly. Uh, but we do have another more detailed example coming up. So this is kind of what I was talking about with the sliding pile in. So we have on the top, we have kind of our good example and our bad example on the bottom. So our bad example is keeping everything ranked up, nice and neat, and getting into base contact with your front rank on your first combat, or on, sorry, right after your charge. On top, we've got things a little bit more free-flowing and moving uh, more toward the outside of that enemy unit. And we're kind of having like a flow away from the middle and around the outside enveloping that enemy unit. So we'll see here that after our first pile in with our top example, those two purple models that we have indicated there, those are the only two that were not able to successfully pile in and get within weapons range during this first combat phase. Whereas the other example, because we had things in base contact and we moved up so neatly, we have six models that are getting left out of this combat, unable to make attacks simply based on positioning. Then we go to the second pile-in move 
on a successive turn. And you'll see that, you know, because we were keeping more distance in the top example and we've allowed ourselves more room to flow around the enemy unit with our pile-in moves because we've kind of kept things so that we're allowing ourselves some space that lets us get all of our models into combat in that second move however with our bad example down on the bottom even though we get that second pile-in move everything is so jammed up because it was already starting this uh, in base contact from the original charge, we're still left with five models that can't get into combat. And they're never going to be able to get into combat uh, unless the enemy unit uh, moves differently. They're just going to be stuck there because all of those other models are locked in place because they are in base contact with the enemy unit. Whew, so that was one heck of a video, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed what you see. And as always, uh, feel free to check out our Patreon that is linked down in the description below. 100% of our proceeds go back to improving the channel through new equipment and software purchases. So uh, if you want to help support us, support you, uh, please consider our Patreon. If you have any additional questions, feel free to drop them down below. And as always, I will see you all later.